pleasure now to introduce our third speaker of the afternoon, and it's Chris Webster. And his talk is Against the Last Man. He was born and raised in the northwest of England, but went to South Africa to live. And, and in 1990, he got a job as a photographer's assistant and moved into Johannesburg and did his postgraduate studies. And in 1996, he was appointed lecturer in fine art at the University of Wales Aberystwyth. And he got his PhD in 2006 and became a senior lecturer, lecturer sorry, in 2016. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you. I'm getting old, it'll take me a moment. Change my eyes. Yeah, so I'm... I am a photographer. I mean, that's, I do take photographs, but um, part of my remit um, as a lecturer is to, is to do research and photo-historical research is, is part of that, as well as practical research. So I've been working on German photography for the last seven years. It's a, there's a long convoluted story as how I got to this point, but suffice to say we've added a lot of German photography to our own um, collection, which of course is publicly accessible as well. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about this. This presentation, normally when I give lectures, I, I don't like talking from notes, but because this is coming from this particular project, which is an exhibition project I'm curating. It'll be touring, it'll start here in Aberystwyth, It'll go to Manchester, then on to Germany, and it involves some parts of a German collection as well in 2019. So this is a summary of some of the, of the catalogue that's going to accompany that exhibition. So forgive me for reading from notes today. So, who are we? What is our, our identity? What relates us, binds us to one group and not another? What makes us who we are? The question of identity has, in the ever-intensifying neo-globalist adventure of the 21st century, emerged once more as the most significant metapolitical question of our times. In the early 20th century, the German photographers I'm discussing today were asking themselves, and by extension, their fellow countrymen and women, the same question. The work that they made was a, a manifestation of a unique time when in the wake of the cataclysm of the, of the First World War, new ideas were struggling to assert themselves and achieve the ascendancy. These manifestations laid the foundations for the seismic, ideological and geopolitical struggles that characterised the last century. Out of the inferno of the 20th century, new metapolitical crises have developed that make identity a force once more to be reckoned with. In his book, Black Sun, in 2002, the late Professor Nicholas Goodrick Clark pointed out, quote, commentators have noted the rise of a new nationalism as a cultural resistance to the recent forces of globalization and immigration. We cannot know what the future holds for Western multicultural societies, but the experiment did not fare well in Austria-Hungary, the Soviet Union, and Yugoslavia. The multicultural challenges in liberal Western states are much greater, and it is evident that affirmative action and multiculturalism are even leading to a more diffuse hostility towards liberalism." End quote. The vast and increasing flow of migrants from the Middle East and the Third World into the Occident has contributed to a continuation of this reaction in the form of a groundswell of identitarian and grassroots nationalist movements in Europe and in the United States. These movements question the logic and motivations for such a massive influx of peoples, putting the blame squarely at the door of internationalist forces of globalization, whilst firmly rejecting multiculturalism and multiracialism. These controversial issues are no longer simply the concern of fringe groups, but now form part of the mainstream narrative, as recent election results have demonstrated. At the turn of the millennium, in an article 
titled seemingly without irony, The Last Days of a White World, the British Sunday newspaper, The Observer, stated, quote, in Britain, the number of ethnic minority citizens has risen from a few tens of thousands in the 1950s to more than 3 million, or around 6% of the total population, while the number of whites is virtually static. Higher fertility and net immigration means the number from ethnic minorities is growing by 2 to 3% a year. One demographer, who didn't want to be named for fear of being called racist, said, it's a matter of pure arithmetic, but if nothing else happens, Non-Europeans will become a, major minority, a majority and whites a minority in the UK. That would probably be the first time in, in a, an indigenous population has voluntarily become a minority in its historic homeland." End quote. Twelve years later, in 2012, after this article was published, indigenous white British people indeed became a minority in the nation's capital of London. By 2015, the flow of migrants arriving in Europe had reached unprecedented levels when over one million people arrived from Western Asia, Southern Asia, and Africa. This trend has not halted, and has been characterized as a demographic time bomb for the West, with even prominent liberal um, cultural figures such as Microsoft's founder Bill Gates suggesting the West should rethink its immigration policies or face disaster. So how does this relate to the photographers I wish to discuss today? Well, the convergence of these existential currents of metapolitics in the 21st century means that looking afresh and reaching to understand an earlier attempt to map a metaphysical interpretation of a nation's soul, a people's identity, during one of the most tumultuous periods of world history has been given a new significance and a new imperative in the homogenizing globalist culture of today. In reaction to these demographic and existential challenges, identitarian politics has resurrected the use of nationalist memetics to powerful effect. The power of photography to form and direct public opinion and affect the interpretation of information and ideas has been well documented. Yet a self-conscious visual literacy, an informed understanding and respect for the influence that a constant exposure to the image can affect is still remarkably uncommon, even in our increasingly image-saturated culture. It is all the more remarkable, therefore, that it is now more than 80 years since the National Socialist regime began employing the power potential of the emergent uh, media of mass communication, cinema, radio, print, photography, and even nascent television, in its efforts to steer the narrative and present another face of Germany to the world and indeed to its own people. The demands for Germany to conform to the ideals of the international family of the League of Nations and to desist its political and racial programs were growing increasingly strident after 1933. The regime presently understood the power potential of photography to mould belief or to conversely to destabilise prestige. In modern parlance, they had quickly grasped the persuasive power of the visual meme. The Berlin Olympics of 1936, illustrated here, were a case in point and ultimately a propaganda triumph that overcame some of the international controversy uh, over the Nuremberg Laws, which had been announced in the previous year, 1935. Radio and innovative television coverage, first-time events such as the Torch Relay, dramatic photographic magazine supplements, an internationally acclaimed film by Leni Riefenstahl, and the temporary curbing of any overt actions against Jews all contributed to the development of an image of Hitler, um, excuse me, an image of Hitler as a popular statesman who was leading Germany in the right direction. The aesthetics of National Socialist photographic propaganda was, like modern advertising imagery, and indeed the political meme, part of a formidable, all-pervasive and certainly persuasive vernacular. So the photographers I've been examining over the last seven years, in particular Ira Kretzlaff and Hans Sebens, made work that became part of this thrust to exploit contemporary media in the service of the state. And I'd just like to summarise each of these photographers briefly. So Erich Max Wilhelm Retzlaff came to photography as a means to engage with the emergent uh, artistic milieu of Weimar. He wanted to express himself artistically and simultaneously make a living. Um, as, after his demobilisation as a soldier at the end of the First World War. But Retzlaff couldn't easily paint. You can see in, this, in the central image there, he's got his right hand behind his back. He was a machine gunner and his right hand had been badly damaged in the, in the war. 
Instead, he set up a small photographic studio on the, the Koenigs Alley in Dusseldorf, and with the enthusiasm of an amateur and no formal training, he set out to learn his craft. His early studio portraits were flattering, fashionable, and commercially viable. The business thrived, he was soon able to move to larger premises on the Kaiserstrasse. In the 1920s, Retzlaff had become interested in the kind of photographic modernism he was beginning to see in, in exhibitions, journals, and the new picture magazines. Um, and it is quite likely that he saw the work of um, August Zander at this time, whose first exhibition had been reviewed in the, the Rheinische Post in 1928. Certainly it was in this period that his, his style and his, his approach changed. Um, and Retzlaff began to explore physiognomy in his practice. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that term, physiognomy, and what it means a little bit more in a moment. So as Retzlaff's studio style changed and aligned itself to this new vision style, the flattering, soft focus work he'd employed in his early commissions was replaced by the sharp focus approach. When Germany became a national socialist state in 1933, Retzlaff had already published three books of photography focusing on the portrait and particularly a physiognomic German proletariat that presaged the rise of this kind of artistic and analytical genre during the years to come. So his first publication in 1930, illustrated here, The Face of Age, was very well received, had a number of very positive critical reviews, both in Germany and abroad. The succeeding two volumes echoed the format of the first, with an emphasis on the face, the drama of the closeness to the subject, and the large format scale of their reproduction. As with Face of Age, Deutsche Menschen presented anonymous subjects. In his introduction to the first volume, the working man's poet, Heinrich Lersch, wrote, quote, These are faces that remain with the folk, evolved with the folk, perish with the folk. And there are certainly interesting life stories to be told, even if their destiny is unknown, end quote. These volumes set the standard that Retzlaff would follow for the next 15 years, including forays into um, journals and magazines, pre press and popular illustrations, publications like Folk und Rasse, national socialist journals like Odal, uh, NS Frauenwarte, and during the war, Signal. He'd become recognised as an important and influential creative practitioner in national socialist Germany. I'll move on to Hans Siebens. This small index card lists his name. Siebens Hans Wilhelm Ludwig. His occupation, photo reporter. His date and place of birth, 25th of March, 1895, Bremen. His status, marital status, he's married. His place of residence, Bob's Vader. And there's no further information, save a little stamp with a capital A and the Roman numeral four. Yet this archive paper trace tells us that even a photographer or perhaps a photographer in particular, was observed, details noted. A4 is amped for that branch of state security known as the Geheime Staatspolizei, or the Secret State, Secret state Police, or Gestapo. Now, contemporary narratives might interpret such a record as disturbing or perhaps even oppressive. But the fact that a professional freelance photographer had a record card devoted, him by, devoted to him by the Gestapo should not surprise us. Photography is a dangerous practice. It can record where it is unwanted. It can convince where there is nothing really to say. And it can pretend it is as much a fictive medium as objective. This card record of Gestapo observation is not evidence that Hans Siebens was considered a, thre a threat to the regime or that he would have been censured in any way. Indeed, Siebens was a very popular, a very successful photographer in the Hitler years uh, and a very much a doyen of the Leica and produced several popular publications that we would term Coffee, t coffee table books today. Prior to the First World War, Siebens had trained as an artist in, in Bremen, and after his war service, he practiced as a graphic artist and landscape painter out of Vorbsvede. He took up photography in 1930, and along with some commercial work, he produced in the main landscapes and portraits in the area that he made his home. This characterization of Siebens as principally a photographer of, of lower Germany persisted through the remainder of his career after 1945. This characterization is evident in the description of Siebens written by his friend and designer Fritz Kemper. Quote, Hans Siebens has photographed the landscape of the North German lowlands, the heath and the moor, the paddocks and the furrowed fields, 
a flat, uns unsensational landscape. It was the discovery of a new continent, like the creation of a new world, the world of the photographer Hans Siebens." End quote. However, Siemens' portraits in this 1942 Dutch publication, Friesland Friesenland, point to another strand in his portfolio. These images are strikingly similar to Ira Kretzlaff's portraits. Um, they often have this tight cinematic close-ups, um, they're very dramatic very often, and they, they tend to indicate a physiognomic approach. So as the, the photographic book title suggests, the, the, the book is centred on, on Frisia, that area along the north coast of the Netherlands and Germany into Denmark. The book emphasises the Nordic qualities of the people and the landscape, a landscape that had been worked and reclaimed over time. Effectively, the book points, extols the virtues of these people as a paradigm of the Germanic type, who, whilst remaining racially pure, harness the bounty of the landscape in an unsophisticated, traditional and untainted lands la landscape. Siebens' contribution is made up of 12 photographs, eight of which are portraits. These images are clearly intended to accentuate the features of the sitters. Typically, they're anonymous, again, we learn nothing about the sitter, save for occasional indications of their profession. The book Friesland Friesenland um, initiated my visit to the, the Hans Siebens archive in, in Vorbsveder in 2013. And it was whilst there we were looking at purchasing from the collection, um, I came across a batch of 29 envelopes um, containing several hundred images, which we've also got in the collection and I'm busy printing now. So the range of people photographed is very much broad in scope, but focused in its intent. They include portraits of fishermen, farmers, sailors, young people, old people, craftspeople, etc. The commonality is that these sitters are all photographed in a similar manner, where the fo focus is very much somatic. The photographer captures their shape, their body shape, their profile, their physical activity, their traditional costumes, their racial characteristics. This is confirmed by the titles written or typed on the envelopes themselves that indicate the context and the profession. Um, so the, the envelopes are titled Kupfer or Volkskupfer, and it's often followed by descriptions such as Junger Bauer mit Axt or a young farmer with an axe. These rediscovered works demonstrate that Siebens had, for a time, been a folkish physiognomist. So again, I'll, I'll summarize these terms in a moment and was like Ira Kretzlaff committed to a folkish image of the Germanic folk. Ultimately, these photographs are intended to show the exemplars of national socialist folk mythos, the pure folk who have a mystical relationship with the earth and who have not succumbed to the perceived dangers of cultural malaise and miscegenation in the cosmopolitan cities as evidenced by their features. So the role of these two photographers two of a much larger group of practitioners, was as, as exemplars of an aesthetic and often metaphysical photographic response to a perceived racial destiny. This photography became a powerful form of pr transfer propaganda. This was a photography that was artfully constructed and contextualised to be consumed, to be enjoyed, and in particular, very importantly, to be identified with. The fact that their work was usually not explicitly ideological, often no banners, flags, insignia, or uniforms, but was implicitly so is also key. The intended viewer could examine these readable photographs and identify their personal place in the National Socialist People's Community, the Volksgemeinschaft, with its aspirations of racial homogeneity and a stable and traditional hierarchy of ability. These relatively unknown photographers offer a similarity of subject matter and, to a large degree, a similarity of approach and motivation with their work sharing a role as part of the widely disseminated visual narrative of a national socialist romanticism of the peasant and the Heimat. In Germany in the interwar period, these contemporaries were delineating a type of photography that was a response to a specific set of circumstances that were both cultural and political. As freelance creative photographers, they were influenced by the modernist currents and trends of the time in art and photography, such as the new vision, this new vision was a term coined in the 1920s and alongside terms such as new objectivity. It refers here to the new photography that sought to celebrate the camera as an extension of the eye and which often employed sharpness of vision, unusual camera angles and dramatic lighting effects. <coughs> 
Unlike the many creatives who left Germany after 1933, these photographers devoted their photographic practice to a depiction of the nation, a search for the traditional, and ultimately a quest for the German racial soul. They were making images that combined avant-garde stylistic approaches, blood and soil ideologies, and a traditional sensibility that revealed a people healthy and vital, often imbued with a romantic mysticism and a closeness to the earth, to the soil of the ancestors. However, these photographers do not figure prominently in the various accounts of the history of photography. Like so many of the photographers who, later, who litter the field of making since photography's invention in 1839, they've become at best a footnote. That's partly because the history of the medium was formed with some notable exceptions in the Anglosphere by a relatively small number of influential recorders who defined what would be termed the canon. It's also the result of the fact that the history of specifically German photography in the antebellum period in particular between the two world wars is one that has been in the main and certainly in English sharply focused on those photographers who rejected national socialism and embraced an internationalist form of the photographic modern with the implicit assumption that those photographers who embraced national socialism were somehow anti-modern, untalented and generally regarded as reprehensible. The tendency in photo history has been to examine until 1933 and subsequently what the creative photographers who left Germany did, or as in the case of those who remained and were censured like August Sander, what they were no longer allowed to do. Literature on specifically creative or art photography in Germany during the Third Reich, and in particular by those supportive or even simply tolerant of the regime, remains remarkably scarce, and where it does exist, almost exclusively negative in its treatment of those photographers who prospered under National Socialism. So during this project, the work of these nationalist photographers has been encountered through the lens of methodological empathy. That is, quote, a fundamental approach to field research that attempts to understand behaviour as it is perceived and interpreted by those under study, end quote. This project is a beginning, and it is hoped that more work will follow where these photographic portfolios can be objectively scrutinised, decoded, and simultaneously appreciated as aesthetic objects of the 20th century. So photographers such as Retzlaff and Siebens regarded their work as art, although photography was considered more a cultural part of the mass media by the National Socialist State. Despite this, these photographs of the traditional costumes, the countryside, the faces of the people, continued to be executed in a manner which was most, at the time corresponded to the avant-garde in the photography of the, era, of the era. This is not work produced in a vacuum, but rather evolved as documents, face, race, body, land, infused with a powerful aesthetic and, as we shall see, mythic core. These practitioners were independently using the machine-generated optical and chemical processes of photography to make work that was, just as cinema was doing in the interwar period, breaking the bounds of its empirical realm in a kind of nationalist, magical realism. These were spaces where mythology might be framed and thus suggested in a real-world setting. Like the metaphorical and staged creative photography associated with modernism, these German photographers were using their medium as a catalyst as a visual philosopher's stone to create an imaginative transmutation in the mind of the viewer and introduce a Germany characterised by the historian Roger Griffin as, quote, a mythicised Germany, sacralised, restored as homeland, rerouted, founded on a new order, united within a single community, healed of sickness, purged of pollution, end quote. Whether or not these photographers themselves fully believed in the myth they were framing is unknown. However, what is certain is the notion that, that a creative and modernist influenced photography ceased to exist in Germany after 1933 can be readily dismissed. Indeed, it can be argued that the opposite was in fact the case. As one American reviewer wrote in 1937, quote, German art photography is the last word in both technical expertness and human sympathy, end quote. It is opposite that these photographers could thus be regarded as modern as well as folkish. But what does this mean? Folkish is a term that defies an easy English translation. It equates somewhat to the English term 
folkish, but it is more than that. In the main, the folkish movement was a smorgasbord of philosophies that placed an emphasis on ethnicity, a desire for unified German Heimat or homeland, organic living and food, nature and romanticism. Photography in Germany, like other modern inventions and ideas, was readily utilised in the promulgation of political and ideological concepts and almost ineffable feelings that, like that of the folkish movement. In line with the development and use of analytical, supposedly objective and including documentary photography in other parts of the world in the 20th century, a variety of paradigms were employed in a broad and systematic document of the German people. In addition to the influence of modernist trends, these photographers were incorporating typological approaches that included a metaphysical and esoteric basis. One of these originally esoteric principles and ultimately an extraordinarily influential part in, this, in photography, the visual arts, literature and science was physiognomy. Nor was this application of physiognomy in this period solely because of a national socialist Weltanschauung. Indeed, it very much predated it. Now, physiognomy is an ancient um, and essentially divinatory practice that is concerned with reading the face and the body in order to understand the nature of the individual, their fate and their character. By the Enlightenment, it had sort of fallen into disrepute and was regarded uh, as associated with things like palmistry and other occult practices. But it was revived in the late 18th century by a Swiss Zwinglian pastor called Johann Kaspar Lavater. And he wrote a, a treatise on physiognomy that became an international bestseller, was translated in most European languages, including English, and had an enormous influence on science and religion uh, and uh, uh, literature throughout the 19th century. So, for example, we see the influence in Dickens, in Hardy, and so on. Um, so um, Walter Benjamin, who was a uh, Jewish philosopher, a German-Jewish German philosopher who's associated with the Frankfurt School, um, discussed the inevitability of a physiognomic regime of the future, remarking, quote, whether one is of the right or of the left, one will have to get used to being seen in terms of one's provenance, and in turn, one will see others in this way too, end quote. So this is... Um, um, Israel Lersky, who was a German photographer, German-born Jewish photographer, who also worked with a physiognomic approach. Just an example there of someone who was not of, of a nationalist bent, but who was making work in a similar way. And you can see this, this photograph of the, of the Israeli or the, the Jewish soldier, um, not Israeli, but Jewish soldier, 1942-43, looking at a, a counterpoint to the, um, the Aryan type as often depicted in this kind of German photography. So this focused engagement with physiognomy in Germany was very broad, certainly not confined to one political faction. Um, and there were shades of difference in analysis, as um, uh, Benjamin has stated, but it was popular for both those on the left and the right of the political spectrum. Physiognomy was tied to interpretations of movements such as, and trends such as nudism, Freikorpikultur, and was seen to reflect the condition of the modern German and ultimately the condition of the new post-war republic. For those sympathetic, sympathetic nationalist photographers, their interpretation of physiognomy was coloured by a folkish interpretation, particularly in their, their photographs of the, of the peasant or the bower. Each of these photographers developed their style influenced by several interconnected factors. The German-speaking world in particular was influenced by a romantic, sometimes reactionary and often revolutionary folklorish atmosphere, as well as a particular understanding of 19th century science, literature and language that sought the origins of the German race and the national epic of the past. This path to the 20th century wended its way between notions of folk and rasse, people and race, entwined in the linguistic, cultural and historic bonds of the pan-German. Whilst employing the supposed objective eye of the camera to produce the racial physiognomic photograph, these portrayals also attempted to point to something beyond classification. Their portraits were certainly ideological, in that they framed their sitters as representatives of an idealised and unsullied Germanic bloodstock. But simultaneously, they are meant to be suggestive of the spiritual. They attempt to point to the numinous. After 1933, this emergent trend continued and developed um, with a physiognomic presentation that often reflected the esoteric and folkish milieu in which they were formed. Such phot photographs were situated as a counterpoint to the perceived dysgenic effects of Weimar cosmopolitanism and urban living, 
They extol the virtues of simplicity, unity, identity and purity that form part of the notion of the German national community. These photographers were bringing their not inconsiderable skills to bear on the creation of a visual metaphor of this national community and the mythos that lay behind it. As archetypes, the figures that they framed are not absolutes, but they are rather an entry point, a gateway that enables a broader understanding to develop. These photographs were an evocation of a time when, according to the eminent psychologist Carl Jung, the spirit of Wotan was reawakening, quote, a god that has taken possession of the Germans, and the house is filled with a mighty rushing wind, end quote. The photographic portfolios of Siebens and Retzlaff are examples of that genre of an idealised photography of the rural and the agrarian that existed in many countries as a projection of national feeling. However, the work here is additionally infused with a mytho-spiritual edge, an echo of this Wotan's awakening. These photographers rode the tide of an upsurge in nationalism that would ultimately break the back of the staggering Weimar Republic, and their work continued during the Third Reich, when they, when they were acknowledged and endorsed by the National Socialist Government. For the work of these photographers was a poetic and romantic one. It was focused on the idealised image of the German, a broad examination of Germans across the Reich, and even beyond, to the larger brotherhood of the German diaspora, as well as the Germanic Northern Europeans in Flanders, the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries. These photographers created a mythic, archetypal and ideological image of the folk, their unique history, their faces, their costumes, their labour, their architecture and their soil. This was a folkish reading of a political geography, a reinforcement and acknowledgement of the cultural force that the new Germany represented. These photographs visually underscore the links between the Heimat-bound German and the soil, a concept that was a central motif of propaganda and the National Socialist Weltanschauung. For these creatives, this photographic work was a manifestation of a radical tradition, a folk song in silver, an ethnographic reckoning, and a romantic catalogue of the native German peoples that transcended the mere materialism of politics. So there were two streams that flowed through and moulded the identity of the emerging National Socialist German state. And the first is familiar to all of us. It's an exoteric one, a broad river of ideas that appealed to the mass of Germans who felt desperate and disenfranchised in the bleak years following the World War. This exoteric current came to define the state that we recognise in historical narratives about this period. The Germany that arose after 1933 was one of extremes and often paradoxical aspirations. A nation of zealous patriotism, it also defined a narrow notion of German history and culture. A militaristic state looked to the east with ambitions of reuniting lost portions of the German Empire following the geopolitical emasculation of the nation under Versailles. As well as areas historically linked to a Germanic tribal and mythic past. It was a state that both embraced nature and a celebration of tradition, as well as seeking a seemingly contradictory accelerated modernization and industrialization. It was a Germany of full employment, a nation that aspired to autarky and that rejected the Weimar era as decadent, submissive and weakly internationalist. It was a racial state that sought to formalise who was Germanic and who was not in order to ensure the development and future survival of the Aryan. The second stream was an esoteric one, or esoteric one, sometimes tenuous, still partly hidden, often still darkly controversial. This influence is less widely known. It also played a significant part in defining what Germany would become under National Socialism. This was a subterranean river, a German Acheron, that flowed with ideas of the irrational, the metaphysical, and notions that acted upon the will. It was sprung from a Germany that looked to reject the curse of Nietzsche's last man and inculcate the Superman or Übermensch. From these sources, a mythic Germany would sprout and grow. This secret Germany looked backwards through a blend of myth legend, race science and occult currents to a divine origin of the Aryan who had emerged in a distant time from an Ultima Thule, the ultimate north. And Janus-like, it also looked forwards to a rebirth, an epic palingenesis, where out of the dead or decaying, de de dying de decadent world, a new one would be forged in fire and blood. The awakening of Germany was therefore to be spiritually and racially transcendent. 
It's in the confluence of these two streams of ideas, the exoteric and the esoteric, flowing into, under, and through Germany, that we can place the work of the photography under examination here. Ultimately, these folkish photographers are signposts. They tell the story of a few photographers who worked with a shared subject and approach influenced by a new vision style, but working independently of one another. They set out passionately and with conviction to photograph the German people and their environs. The extant work of these folkish photographers offers an intriguing insight into the use of photography as an embodiment of creative imaging informed by an often esoteric creed and an exoteric politics. In their pre-1945 work, their photography dynamically combined a nationalist worldview and image making. They came out of an era when the boundaries of the emergent genre of documentary photography had already begun to significantly blur with political ideas. It was a time when creative photographers were selected over pure technicians because not only did they tell, they told with beauty. The work looked objective and simultaneously attractive, but it was also powerfully influential. And I'm just going to move on to the last section now. Could you just briefly explain to me what Nietzsche's last man thing was? Nietzsche, um, I'll, I'll touch upon it again in a moment, but the idea is that um, in, in, the, in the era of post-God, um, the last man is the person who is um, happy to sit back, let the world carry on around him, and not, not affect any kind of change in the world. In other words, an, an, an ultimate nihilist and individualist. Like other folkish photographers, Ira Kretzlaff and Hans Siebens were in their time prolific and celebrated practitioners whose works were widely published in books, journals and magazines between the two world wars. Indeed, their photography, their photographs were even favourably received and commented upon outside their native Germany. The ignominy that they've each suffered to one degree or another stems primarily from the fact that their output and star continued to rise during the 12 years of National Socialist rule in Germany and that they profited from this association. The numerous studies, books and exhibitions on the work of the photographer August Sander might be considered a case in point. Sander was suppressed, ergo Sander is worthy of study. As such, the aesthetic merits of the work of these folkish photographers, or indeed their relationship to the practice of other photographers who were working in similar genres outside of National Socialist Germany, have been largely ignored. These photographic works were an attempt to affirm the notion of the German nation as the organic state and to remind Germans of the supposed group homogeneity. Most of all, they show that German landscape space inhabited by people who were framed as both ordinary and heroic. In addition to a focus on traditional costume, these photographers experimented with the physiognomic portrait and to a large degree remained focused on it. The people they represented are physiognomically readable as doughty, strong, unconquerable, and bearers of a special historical legacy. These images were much more than an aesthetic distraction during tumultuous times. In their projects, these photographers were tapping into and contributing to a unifying cultural current of which the people, the folk, could collectively feel ownership of. But it was even more than this. These images were aesthetic signposts, entry points into the national myth by photographers using new vision techniques bound with archetypal images of a mythic origin of the German peoples. The subjects are advanced as being the exemplary bearers of the ancestral racial soul, as evidenced by their physical characteristics, their traditional costumes, their customs, habits, and their attachment to the very soil upon which they lived. Blood and soil bound the entire portrait together in this representation of these people as cultural aristocrats. In some of the photographic books that carried the work of these photographers, the faces of the subjects are reproduced to close to life size, the crop tight and the full page filled with features lit by a hard, bright sun. The subjects return the viewer's gaze resolutely or stare out into their hinterland. These close-up photographs force the viewer to look longer at the face, into the face, to engage with it and contemplate themselves within this silvered mirror. As well as the familiar resolute quality of these photographic faces, they are often, quite often, tranquil and unambiguous. Most of all, these photographs are powerful and evocative constructions, directed and staged, a theatre 
that was cloaked in what was then a new language of aestheticised documentary photography. As such, they were unsurprisingly highly valued by the propaganda machine of the state. For example, Falkner Asa was a touring exhibition between 1934 and 1937, organised by the De Deutsche Hygiene Museum and the uh, NSDAP Office of Racial Purity. And it featured large numbers of this photographer's physiognomic folkish work. In the brochure that accompanied uh, this exhibition's opening in Frankfurt's town hall, the reader was advised, quote, every German man and every German woman must go into this exhibition and allow this display to have its effect on them. An hour of such an instructional lesson is more effective than spoken or read word, end quote. Similarly, reporting in the same exhibition, the Reichsgazetteblatt wrote enthusiastically, quote, thus, this exhibition reveals the great inner connections between blood and soil, race and ethnicity. It teaches that every one of us is a member of a great chain of ancestors and that our fate is defined by those who preceded us just as our people's future will be a reflection of us. There is probably no more vivid a reminder of the great responsibility that each one of us bears for his people than this exhibition." End quote. The use of photographs and displays such as this touring exhibition were offered as a pedagogic visual exercise, the consummate corrective to the destructive cosmopolitanism and nihilism that had, it was asserted, almost overwhelmed Germany in the years following the First World War. These, are, these images all date from before 1945, when this kind of photography, political concepts and image making worked together in a forceful combination. They stem from an era when the boundaries of what would then become known as documentary were already shifting from an attempt at chronicling everyday life and events in a supposed objective manner and were blurring with overt political ideologies. It was a process that was malleable. Nor were such ideas of using the real to tell stories confined to the propaganda of National Socialism. This was a universal notion that was growing as a means of revealing through directing the everyday, as demonstrated by the photographers of Roosevelt's Depression-era Farm Security Administration. In line with this transformation, innovative British documentary filmmaker and contemporary of these, contemporary of these photographers, John Grierson, stated, quote, I, I look on cinema as a pulpit and use it as a propagandist, end quote. The photographic works here illustrated are also examples of the artist as cultural producer who framed the documentary reel with a dreamlike mysticism. The visual narrative of these works introduces us to a perfect harmonious living realm, an organic state. These photographs were of a vision that rejected rootlessness, individualism, universalism, cosmopolitanism, and sought to restore tradition a system where there was no distinction between nature and the order of human things. Such a traditional order in the organic state was clearly characterised by Julius Evola of the traditionalist school. Quote, A state is organic when it has a centre, and this centre is an idea that shapes the various domains of life in an efficacious way. It is organic when it ignores the division and the autonomization of the particular, and when, by virtue of a system of hierarchical participation, Every part within its relative auto autonomy performs its own function and enjoys an intimate connection with the whole. End quote. The philosopher Martin Heidegger saw national socialist collectivism and the celebration of tradition as an antidote to the approach of nihilist individualism, human scale against modern gigantism. In a lecture from 1935, Heidegger had outlined what he considered as the real value of national socialism. Quote, the works that are being peddled about nowadays as the philosophy of National Socialism have nothing whatever to do with the inner truth and greatness of this movement, namely the encounter between global technology and modern man, end quote. That is, according to Heidegger, the inner truth of National Socialism lay in its organicism, in its promise of a counter-propositional stance to a deleterious effects of modernity. This is precisely what these photographers were constructing, visual artefacts of the traditional in opposition to the nihilism of the modern world and the era of Nietzsche's last man. The work of these folkish photographers provided a visual metaphor of an idealised and exclusively Germanic nationalist utopia, with a focus on the qualities of the people, and by extension the viewers themselves, linked together in a common bond and with a shared and often mythic heroic past. It is a place where the community, and thus the state, coexist 
growing from the devotion of the individual as part of the whole, emerging out of the legacy and traditions of the past, whilst looking with optimism to the future. Viewed objectively, these photographs debunk the suggestion that National Socialism lacked, quote, the interest in talent of outstanding photographers and editors, end quote. These photographers were superb technicians and had a strong aesthetic sensibility. But therein lies the difficulty for the post-1945 viewer. These photographs are not neutral. They're used by the Office of Racial Policy in various publications and expositions, such as the Falkland Rasser exhibition we looked at a moment ago, situates them as ideological objects and thus inextricably bound to the fundamental vision of the National Socialist State. To examine this folkish photography, this visual expression of the body of the organic state, is to examine the inculcation of a mass understanding of race as metaphysics to Germany during this period. Their work might be considered a part of that enterprise to form a gesamt Kunstwerk, or total work of art, out of the Volkskörper, the organic body of the nation itself. Thank you. Did I race, did I race through too quickly? <laughs> it was brilliant, fantastic. Um, taught me an awful lot. Whatever the political message behind those photographs, I think they were beautiful as well, weren't they? That, you know, they were. Well, well, this is the, 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 the very interesting aspect about them is the fact that they are... I mean, I don't know how many people have ever heard of Ira Kretzlaff. So they're, they're unknown photographers. And the, um, the, the problem for me is, the fact, as a, as a photo historian, is that you, you form then a lacuna in the history if you miss out people because you, you don't like their politics. Yeah, so. cool. I thought they were lovely photographs. Have we got any uh, questions? I'm curious about the, the two photographers. Were they actually being directly influenced by the Metro Socialists, or were they allowed to do their own thing? Were they well, they were, they were freelance photographers, so they were working to commission very often. So, but they were also very much influenced by the cultural um, milieu of the period, which was physiognomy was an enormously influential aspect of it. New vision techniques we see in, across the spectrum in terms of that, that very dynamic close-up, hard dramatic lighting, that kind of thing. Um, Ira Kretzlaff was, was a member of the National Socialist Party. Hans Evans was not. Um, Kretzlaff claimed post-war that he'd just joined because it was the thing to do. But I've seen his membership card and he regularly re renewed his membership throughout them. So, you know, there's, the, the, the trouble with looking at these histories is, of course, because of the fact, um, because of the, the very situation after the war, these photographers distanced themselves and developed alternative histories of their practices. So it's hard to piece that together fully. Um, but yeah, they were, um, they would often be directed. So they may, for example, have been, there was a, a project um, that, uh, Heinrich Himmler, uh, Himmler had a group called the Arnenerbe, which was ancestral heritage, and they were um, interested in this kind of photography. And, and Retzlaff was teamed up with a Dutch photographer, uh, a guy called Heemske Duyke, and they were meant to do a project on the Dutch and their relationship as part of the Germanic folk. It never materialised, but they were given cameras and film and so on. So there were directed moments, but they were just relying on those photographers to do their thing, because they already knew what they were doing prior to 1933. Retzlaff was producing this kind of work anyway, and he was a nationalist, so, you know, for him it was, it was an important project to visualise the German people like this. Um, have you got anything to say about Otto Dix, who was um, the leader of the new objectivity, who seems to be in a very s strange situation to me, because on the one hand, he was what we nowadays might call um, edgy, um, rather nihilistic. On the other hand, he remained in um, the Third Reich throughout the um, years, and his aesthetic seemed to me to be quite similar to the ones that were shown us this afternoon. I think you've summarised it very nicely there. I, think, I mean, Dix was, um, was, I don't know as much about him as, of course, as, as the photographers, but it's, no, but I think, but right. yeah, but, um, but absolutely, I think there was, you see, the thing is, it's like Emil Nolder, who was, um, who was an ardent National Socialist, of course, at the beginning of the year, but, if, but he was prescribed because his work didn't really conform. I think it was after about 1936, it may have been a bit earlier, when the, maybe about 34, but when the, the, the state decided what, what the, the visual nature of the state would be. Up until that period, there'd been a lot of debate, and of course, people like Goebbels was very much for expressionism, supportive of expressionism, 
but Hitler was very much for um, very, very classical types of representation. Yeah, I don't know. So I think you know, Dix is an interesting character in that sense. Because Nolder was very much more of the expressionist um, school and, and went to uh, primitive um, art forms in the uh, South Sea Islands, that sort of influence. But Dix was very much more yeah. photographic, more, more yeah. intense in um, aesthetic. But he did really prosper, very much because of he, 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 he coexisted within that world. But he didn't quite fit, I would argue. I don't know. Would you agree? He didn't quite fit within that. that oh, the sure. kind of, you know, um, and he's now celebrated. So that's quite interesting, too. That's an interesting one, actually. Yeah. I don't know whether the Germans had the same attitude to the countries they occupied, particularly the Czech Republic, where photographers using surrealism as a means of communication, where the photographs were actually tried and locked up in prison cells. I don't know. I don't know. Every, it? <laughs> and, and in fact, there are, there are books now you can buy in the Czech Republic of the photographs. Um, and they are actually sort of, they are serious images of the German occupation. I think w when we look at those, those kind of situations, um, we have to look at them in the, through the lens of the, of the, of the time that they existed, yeah. which was effectively moving into the war period where well, yeah. it was, you know, um, incredibly mad censure, you know, and, and often contradictory censorship as well. Well, in yeah. fact, in the end, this particular photographer was in fact locked up, but it took them a long time to get around to, to um, not releasing his photographs. Mm. But no one told his photographs were ever released until after the war. Well, I've seen examples of, of um, early German um, collage, but in a nationalist sense. So we see, we see famous anti-national anti socialist mm collage works um, but there was actually there, there was there were early experiments with it but because it as the kind of um, the style of the state it became more fixed those kind of things fell to the wayside you know, so they were seen as being you know count, um, counterproductive I'm, I was quite surprised by some of it because I think someone had asked me what kind of images I considered to be so direct it would have been more flaxen-haired little girls with pigtails, genital skirts, nail holes, and either that or the massive, impressive martial rally, kind of, kind of uh, operatic almost rally. That was perhaps just one strand of an elaborate tapestry of, of imagery and art that they used to propagate their, their belief. Yeah, absolutely, um, and they, had, they, they each had their own kind of place. So these these photographers were very much producing images um, that people would be encouraged to relate to. And as, as I said, there they would be rec very very importantly they would they would be used as mirrors, so people could identify themselves in these pictures as part of the state. I mean, the whole idea of the the, the Nordic ideal w was very much part of the state's ideology in terms of the flaxen-haired person, but there was a great deal of debate about that too. Um, and it wasn't it, the Hollywood depiction of, of what the, the national socialist idea of every, the blonde Ubermensch is, is, a, is, a, is something of a falsity. Um, the Germans recognized that the Germans were Alpine types, Nordic types, um, Falians, uh, and mixed types. So they didn't, you know, Hitler was very keen not to just promote a, a kind of a Nordic image, the Nordic ideal. Um, but it was, did play a part, and there was the Nordic ring. and. Uh, people like uh, Walter Dare, who was the, the Reichsbauernführer, the leader of the farmers, um, was very much part of the Nordic push. But you know, it wasn't it wasn't universal. So you get that. But yes, the, those kind of images do exist, and, and some of the, the f photographs these photographers made conform to that. But it depends on the context as well. You know, just as we have advertising imagery and tourist travel books and different kinds of image form forms today.
organising and helping out, then we of course can do everything. So, jump my yard if you need, I'm broke. <laughs>